Please be seated. Uh, folks, before I lead in a word of prayer, I uh, just want to uh, uh, send some greetings from Matt and Martha Brush. Uh, they appreciate your prayers uh, as, they, uh, as she recovers. Um, also, let's not forget uh, our country, uh, the people that are listed on the back of the bulletin. Um, God is gracious, God is able, and loves to meet us during this time right where we're at. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, and I mean gracious, uh, we come to you this morning as your people. Uh, we're a needy people, but we're your people, and we've been clothed with the Lord Jesus Christ and we've been given all the riches that heaven could ever afford. And we are a blessed people. And yet we come this morning because we're a needy people. Uh, we want to bow down and worship. Uh, we, we come here this morning to say that you're my God. You're our God. And as we gather, Lord, we pray that you would receive our worship uh, that you would open the hearts, uh, uh, our hearts and minds, and we would understand the scope and the breadth and the height and the depths with which you have loved us with an everlasting love, uh, that we would have a confidence before you, a holy boldness before you, that you're the forgiver of sin, you're the lover of our souls, uh, you're the one uh, with whom we have to do, and you've set your heart uh, on us in eternity. And may we be ever mindful of that. Uh, as we, Lord, delight in our children, and even though we're not always happy with them and what they do, we, we love them uh, unconditionally. And may we be ever mindful that you love us unconditionally and that you delight in your children. And may we have great, great confidence and find great hope and great strength this morning in those thoughts. Uh, we pray that you would take every uh, worldly care and burden this morning uh, that we've allowed to rest on our hearts, uh, the things that we've brought in here today, um, that we should have left at your feet and at the door. Uh, we pray that you would take them and uh, uh, that you would fresh, refresh our hearts and our minds and our thoughts uh, heavenward, and that we might see uh, the glories of Christ as he constantly lives to make intercession for us. And Lord, that we might be ever mindful that there's nothing that's too hard for you. There's nothing that you can't handle. There's no obstacle that you cannot remove. Uh, there's nothing that's impossible with you. And uh, so uh, we give you those things uh, that weigh our souls down, uh, that uh, easily entangles and trips us up. And uh, we're just such a, a blessed people to be able to be here this morning to worship you and to be with brothers and sisters in Christ of like mind and faith. Uh, Father, uh, for those that are listed on the, on the back of our bulletin, uh, you know their situation completely. Uh, we pray that you would minister encouragement of heart, comfort, grace, a renewed hope, strength of heart, mind, body, soul. Uh, and I pray that you would do that even now. Uh, also, Father, uh, especially mindful of the shirtlifts and Mike with his, uh, his situation. Um, may he sense your presence. Uh, think of Diana Wynn this morning. Uh, encourage her heart and um, renew her hope, uh, fix her eyes, uh, she fix her eyes on you. Also, Father, too, um, think of uh, Martha. Thank you for the marvelous recovery that you've been uh, giving to her. Uh, we also lift up Matt, um, encourage his heart uh, as well. Uh, also, Father, too, uh, think of our country, uh, the many needs of our country, our leaders, uh, from the White House down to local government. Um, not exactly sure, Lord, how to pray this morning, but uh, Harold reminded us um, that we are to ask for wisdom over riches and uh, seek you over uh, gold and silver. 
And um, that's my prayer for our leaders, uh, from the White House down to uh, the town leaders in this town and all across America. May we be ever mindful uh, that uh, riches and honor and gold and silver uh, positions are fleeting, uh, but the word of God stands forever. Uh, you're forever, Lord, and uh, we, uh, we bless you and thank you that uh, we can enter into this time and lift these prayers uh, heavenward, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we have a reading of scripture this morning, please. Our first reading this morning is from the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, and it's found on page 1017 of the New Black Church Bibles. And it's on the screen in the back there, too, so I may, if I lose my place by looking up and down, give me a break. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of the sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, Yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under no obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. <clears throat> For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of our Lord. This morning's second scripture reading, also from the New Testament. From the book of James, the first chapter, verses 12 through 28, and in the New Church Bibles, that can be found on page 1091. Again, the book of James, the first chapter, verses 12 through 18. And James writes, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, 
I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. So says the word of our Lord. Moses is giving commands. <laughs> Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, speak to our hearts during this time. Give us insight into your word and what you've laid upon my heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Solomon says in Proverbs 14, verse 12, there is a way which seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. Uh, the Apostle Paul also write in Romans, wrote in Romans 7, chapter, chapter 7, verses 19 through 21 and verse 25, he wrote, For the good that I wish to do, I do not do, but I practice the very evil I do not wish. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. Who will set me free from this body of death? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So the last, the last three weeks, we've looked at the exchanged life. And it's tapping into the resurrected life of Christ. The living word is the spirit of God who lives within. And so the goal is to let him live through our lives. Now, I mentioned words like surrendering, yielding, bringing every thought captive, thinking on Jesus, renewing the mind. So what I want to do is I, this morning, I want to talk to you about the behavior chain. Now, this is not a sequel to the messages regarding the exchanged life, but what it will do, it was actually... It nicely fit in with that, though. So the, the behavior chain, I kind of express it in this way, it's about identifying habitual patterns of behavior, sinful patterns of behavior. And so if you think about it, if the goal of the exchanged life is to let Jesus live by developing or cultivating his life, then it is also important to recognize and identify sinful behavioral patterns which stifle his life. So at, at Wednesday prayer and Bible study, I don't know how we got talking about it, but we talked about how as we get older, we get like our parents. You know, when we're younger, we say, I'm not going to be like my mom, I'm not going to be like my dad. Bill, what did you say? We totally, totally become like our parents. That's what we do. Now, that can be a good thing. That can be a bad thing. Spiritually speaking, if we're becoming like our Heavenly Father, that's a good thing. And if we are living after the sinful nature, then that's a bad thing. So when you think of learned behavior, you want to think of behavior as good or bad. Uh, we've all heard the expression, monkey see, monkey do. That's learned behavior. Learned behavior is typically associated with physiology and the psychology of animals. Uh, animals are very, very behavioral. Uh, if you 
went to college, you probably had, you know, Psychology 101, basic psychology course. And I remember in that course where they talk about Pavlovian conditioning. And basically, it's after a Russian scientist named Pavlov who did experiments with animals. And what he tried to do was elicit a certain kind of behavior that would follow you know, naturally from the dog's behavioral instincts. And afterwards, what he would do is he would create associations that could actually trigger that bodily reaction. So it's basically learned behavior that's associated. And it's cause and effect. It deals with rewards positively and negatively. Well, if you think about it, learned behavior also applies to human beings. We're, we're behavioral. And this was brought home to me in very, very significant ways last year. So I decided to lose weight, and I shared this with some of you individually. I may have shared it at one point from the pulpit. But I'm sitting there watching the Stanley Cup playoffs last year, and there's this advertisement for Noom, N-O-O-M. And it's a program that they, they, they talk about how you get the weight off and keep the weight off. And so I, I was interested, and I started to research it a little bit. Now, anytime somebody mentions psychology, I get a little spooked. Because, you know, I tend to go toward the scriptures, I get rid of the psychology part, but I get a little spooked because I think some of it works, but I'm a little skeptical of a lot of it. So I was skeptical, but I researched it, I decided to buy into it, and it worked. I lost upwards of 37 pounds. I've kept 25 of it off because I wanted to gain an additional 12 pounds or so. I didn't want to be at 166 pounds. I got to 166 pounds so I could get a medical discount, amen? But I wanted to be more like around 175 or 180, and I've been able to keep it off. So how does that work? Because I've been able to tap in to the psychology part of the program and identify certain learned behavior as it relates to eating. Now, I'm telling you, it works. So the program is psychology-based, it's not a fad diet, but what they do is they take scientific information about understanding the body in relation to food, and they talk about how your body processes food, and it also talks about how we think about food and how we interact with food. And so it uses psychology as foundational to change learned behavior. Now, I was diligent in applying those principles. I followed the program. As I was going through the program, I also looked at this from a spiritual point of view. And I said to my wife at some point, they ought to take this program and put it into a spiritual application because it was so uncanny in terms of, as I looked at the behavioral, my behavioral in relation to food and how I think, and the bodily reactions to it, and also the spiritual dynamic, as I assessed it spiritually in my heart, I thought, there's something here. Because it helps you identify certain behaviors and patterns of thinking. And that's huge when you talk about identifying patterns of sinful nature. Now, I'm not into the psychology and into the behavioral sciences, but like Paul and like Solomon, I know that there is a thinking and a behavior that leads to death. And I know that that principle is at work in me, and it's also at work in you. And how many countless times have we said to God, why do I do the things I don't want to do? We all say it, right? Murray, you're laughing, but we all say it. Why is it? Paul says that it's the sin nature at work in us, and yet we also know that God is delivering us from that, that sin nature, that thought pattern. 
So there is a bodily response and a thinking response that it actually goes against the law of God. And yet God has given us the mind of Christ to override that. So in other words, sinful behavioral patterns of thought combine with behavioral responses in the body. Because Paul says, who will deliver me from this body of death? You see, in the body, in the flesh, as long as we're in the body in the flesh, we deal with the sin nature because the sin nature is inherently tied to the flesh. You see? And so what happens is sinful, sinful thought processes and patterns, behavioral patterns, follow some are reflexive in nature, kind of like, you know, when you go to the doctor and he, you know, he hits, your, he hits your knee to see what your reflexes are, you see? And then there's other times where those sin nature responses are very predictable. You can see it coming. We see a certain body and mindset pattern with animals, don't we? Animals are very behavioral. If you have an animal, you know, they, they're, they're, they're wired with, it, it's almost weird, but they know when they want to eat. There are certain behavioral expectations and patterns that they have learned based on their little personality to develop. You can see it. They just know when to eat and they know when they have to go out, and you almost kind of have a base. You look at your animal and you say, oh, this is what they want, right? Now, this is true with people even though we're different than the animals, right? We know that we're different. You know, Genesis tells us that we're created in the image and likeness of God. We're moral beings, we're fallen beings, but we're also behavioral we have a, behave, a behavioral or an animalistic side to us all. Now, it's how we're biologically wired. And it's not unlike the animal behavior. Now, I'm not saying we're animals. You'll see some people today that will refer to your animal side. I'm not saying that we're animals. I'm referring to your behavioral side. But what I am saying is, that there are behavioral tendencies that fall into the realm of basic biological needs. It's the reflexive knee-jerk reaction. And I'm also saying that these, some of these sinful tendencies are tied to the flesh. Now, let, let's keep this simple here. Let me tell you what the Noom program or the behavioral chain is. It's a trigger. It's a thought. It's an action, and it leads to a consequence. Four basic, a trigger, a thought, an action, a consequence. And sinful patterns follow that behavioral chain as well. Take a look at James chapter 1, verse 15. James indicates that this is the basic pattern of sin. James chapter 1, verse 15. When lust has conceived, so lust is the trigger, you desire something, is conceived, that's a thought, and it gives birth to sin, that's an action, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death, that's the consequence. Trigger, thought, action, consequence. That's the, that's the basic progression of the sinful pattern. <laughs> That's, amazingly, the noom behavior chain. So there's something, there's something here, there's something to it. Now, noom speaks of the psychology-based you know, program based on food and losing weight. James speaks of this as the sinful nature. So if we wonder why we struggle to surrender or abide or yield to the life of Christ, it's because sinful patterns of behavior in the sin nature have been established and developed for a very, very long time. And those sinful patterns of thought have been established for a very, very long time. 
So in other words, what we're dealing with here is a behavioral chain. It's behavioral. Now, last week when I talked on, the last several weeks when I talked on the exchanged life, I talked about the I part, or the me part, and the him part. And I used that to distinguish specifically between us and the life of Christ. Now, Paul tells us that the I is not really here. It's the sin nature at work in us. And that's, but that's why I use that distinction. And so my spiritual analysis with this whole thing, I believe is very relevant to understanding the I part in the Christian life. Let me give you a quick overview to the book of James here. Uh, it's very, very practical. James is one of these books that should be read with the Gospel of John. Gospel of John is about the life, light, and truth of Christ. James is very, very practical. They're, they're, they, they fit very, very nicely. And if you go through chapter 1 here, James introduces a bunch of topics that he's mostly going to comment on in the following chapters of his book. But what I want you to see here in chapter 1, and this is especially relevant to every believer, we have the concepts of testing, and we have the concepts of temptation. Now, if you, and it's important to distinguish between the two of them. If you take a look at verse 2, James talks about trials and testing, and they go hand in hand, and it's in the context of God sending a trial to refine us in terms of character and our faith. In other words, it's, it's a proving and a, and a refining time. God is the agent. God sent it. So, for example, Job would be a great example of a trial to prove what's in the heart of Job. You, you know the book of Job. Trials and testings, by the way, also prove whether a person is a believer or not. Because some people fall away never to come back again. So trials and testings sent by God refine the believer and cause, cause the unbeliever to fall away. But if you notice now in verse 12, James picks up the trial, but now he talks about it in the context from trials and testing, he moves to trials and temptation. And he's talking about temptation and being drawn into sin. And this is really, really important. Temptation is different from a test. In temptation, the devil's the agent. In a test, God is the agent. In a temptation, the goal is to cause the believer to sin and fall. In a test, it proves and refines the believer. Now, for example, uh, Peter would be a, a, a great example of uh, the temptation. You recall the Gospels where Jesus said to Peter, you know, Satan wants to sift you, but I have prayed for you. So the sifting still happened. Peter still, still fell into temptation and sinned. But God rescued him and delivered him and restored him from that sin. Whereas Judas, we know the end of Judas. So I highlight these two areas of distinction because I want you to see the movement in the passage. And what James does here is this. He, like, like testing, he spends a couple of verses, verses 2, 3, and 4, on the whole idea of trial and testing. But then he spends several verses on the whole idea of temptation. And, you know, to help us to identify the sinful patterns as they develop. Trigger, thought, action, consequences. Lust, conceived, brings forth sin, death. And that's the movement. Now, take a look at uh, verses, uh, verse 13 here. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted 
by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. So God is not the agent here. There's no dark with, darkness with God. If you skip down to verse 16 and 17, James says, Do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In other words, God's not changing. One day he's testing you, and the next day he's tempting you. That, that, that's not God. God dwells in unapproachable light. There's no dark side to him. So James here eliminates the duality part. You know, in the Greek mind, you know, they would think that there's forces of good and evil in the world, and they're equally um, um, paired and comparable. James is saying no. God doesn't introduce sin. God doesn't change. He's greater than all that. And take a look at verse 18 here. Because James shares something about the written word that we talked on, talked about the last couple of weeks. The written word it gives us spiritual parameters so we know the difference between right and wrong. He says, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So that we might be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. So, so we're first fruits, and the goal always has been that God would make us spiritually fruitful. Now, if you're following here, let's go back to verse 14. We didn't read that yet. We skipped over it. James says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Everyone is tempted just like everyone is tested. But temptation relates to potential sinful behavior. Now, notice I said potential, because you can lust for something and then, or someone, and you can then have a thought, but not actually carry out the act. Now, the thought can be sinful, but the action is into a different level. So, so back to the behavioral and the psychology part. The sin nature follows a spiritual pattern of process and behavior. It's tied to the bodily nature and it's grounded in basic bodily needs and responses. That's the animal side to the body of flesh. And James teaches that sinful triggers and thoughts are bound to happen. The question is, what do we do with them when they happen? Because sinful thoughts are a given. I could have a thought where I prejudge a situation, and I have no, no clue as to what I'm thinking about. You see? Thoughts are a given, but... Actions, sinful actions, are not necessarily a given. Now, let me, let me use food as a point of reference, if I can develop this thought a little bit, uh, to illustrate sinful patterns of behavior. So, what does a behavioral pattern look like? Uh, let's talk about your morning routine. Now, I'm not going to ask you you know, individually what your morning routine is, but I want you to think about your morning routine. Because every morning when you get up, as a creature of habit, you have a routine, don't you? Okay. So, let's talk about my routine, okay? I barely make it down the steps. I stagger to the coffee pot. That's what I do. Every single morning, that's what I do, okay? Uh, by the way, I was talking to Brian Arnellis at the end of church service last week. We were talking about the message that I gave last week. And we got talking, and I said, I said, Brian, this is my behavioral pattern. Coffee pot every morning. He goes, me too. Now, if going to the coffee pot is a sinful behavior, then Brian and I are the chief of sinners, okay? But like Pavlov's dog... I've gone to the coffee pot. I have a learned behavior. 
That's my routine. And it simply illustrates that I am a creature of habit just like you. Now, there's nothing wrong with coffee. Uh, going to the coffee pot is not sinful. But again, think through the pattern of sin. When you start to develop a sinful pattern, it's like going to the coffee pot. Now, let me, let me stick with the coffee analogy. Because I, I have multiple cups of coffee through the day. In the afternoon, when I have a cup of coffee, I always associate it, Jerry knows where I'm going with this, I always associate it with a couple of cookies. <laughs> what are you laughing, Marie? I always go to the cookies. I have two cookies. Occasionally three. Okay? She's laughing because we argue whether she's the cookie... Yeah, cookie monster, right. Cookie, I'm the cookie man, she's the cookie monster. And when Marie's not around, I'm the cookie man monster. That's what I am. Okay. But, but this is what I want you to see. Afternoon coffee is associated, the association, with cookies. I've developed that behavior pattern. Now, that's the result. I'm like Pavlov's dog. But I've got to tell you this. I watched my mother for years, and I mean years, do the same thing. And I've watched her 15 to 20 minutes before dinner. What do I do, Jerry? I go into the pantry and I grab a cookie before dinner. And it's so behavioral. So I, I'm, I'm, am I blaming my mother? Yeah. But I'm not, I'm not blaming my mother like Joe Biden blames Donald Trump for everything. Okay? <laughs> That's my problem. It's learned behavior. I, I own that as well. But I've learned it from my mother. Now, back to the coffee, uh, the cookies, all things in moderation, right, right, Marie? This is the point that I'm making, that sinful patterns and thoughts follow sinful behaviors and patterns in much in the same way that we see it biologically where we're creatures of habit, we go to the coffee pot or we go to the cookies. It's true. Tell me, you, I want you to, to, to do that kind of test pattern this week to tell me if you can't start to identify some of your sinful patterns. But lust, I want a cup of coffee. The trigger, the sinful thought follows <laughs> the cookies. I grab the cookies and next thing you know I've put on 160 calories. That's how it works, okay? A couple more food illustrations. I used to pump gas years ago before I started the courier business. I shared this story years and years ago, but it's very, very prominent in my mind. So, in the gas station they sold candy. And I got into this Kit Kat kick. And I started eating Kit Kats like there was no tomorrow. I mean, it was bad. But at the time, they were bombarding the airwaves with that commercial. Now, you know the commercial, right? Give me a break. Give me a break. Break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar. <laughs> and so I went in there, and I, and I was like, and like a dog, and I kept on eating and eating and eating, and it was not good. The Kit Kats were good, but it was not good. And, and so this is what I want you to see. The, the craving, the bombardment, the pattern, the power of suggestion, and you just reflexively or predictably go for it. That's, what, that's, that's the way it works. And that's the way the world works. We are constantly being bombarded with the power of suggestion, worldly concepts, sinful concepts, and stimulation all day long. And we develop patterns, and by the way, those suggestions and that bombardment is designed to, to produce a particular response. Just like you are checking out at a cashier, right? And they have an impulse item, like the little mints on the table, you know, right at the cashier. It's there to elicit the behavior, oh, I'll get some mints. That's what it is. 
And it's so predictable. And the environment is huge. So, very quickly here, back to the Noom program. Because one of the things that they talked about was environmental triggers. They're, they're huge. Let me, let me give you a, an environmental trigger. You go into a Dunkin' Donuts, you know where I'm going, you go into a Dunkin' Donuts to get a coffee. What's, what's the trigger? You see a donut. You see the shelves of donuts. And right away it's like, I'll get a donut. No, I'll get two. No, I'll get two dozen. I'll take a dozen home. And, and it's crazy. It's crazy. That's the trigger, right? You know, it's almost like they shout your name. So it's totally about environment. It's totally about self-control. But it's also totally about saying no. And when we learn to say no, we develop the mental and spiritual and emotional muscle to say no. We actually get stronger. And that works with temptation too. And I mention all this because the exchanged life starts with the behavioral thought process of appropriating the life of Christ and identifying the triggers and the thoughts so that God would live for himself and that we wouldn't let the sinful nature live out. Now, let me, uh, let's get away from the food analogies and I want to talk about some sinful patterns, all right? So years ago, as a young Christian, I go to buy some clothes and I'm in this dressing room, I'm trying on clothes and I see a really, really nice shoehorn on the floor. And, and, and sort of like, oh, I could use that. And I, a God being my witness, the thought was, oh, just take it and put it in your pocket. Now, I'm a young believer, right? Right away, I recognize, wait, wait a minute, that's stealing. That's what God told me. That's stealing. <laughs> you can't do that. And I'm telling you, I tried to put my shoes on, I, mean, I tried to put my clothes on without looking at that shoehorn or touching it for the next five, seven minutes. It was insane. But it was, it was a really nice shoehorn. I mean, it was like jazzed out. It was like about 18 inches. I wouldn't have to bend over. It was incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. And so, and so what I'm trying to say is, is that, it, you know, the lust of the shoehorn, and it's like, oh, I could use it, and oh, take it, which I didn't. And if I did, then it would have been sinful. And I didn't want that on my conscience, you see? Now, I, I won that one. I won that temptation. The other week, remember I said to you, when we were talking about living life through the power of the Holy Spirit, I said I didn't do very well that week. I didn't have a very good resurrected life week. So I noticed something else. I dropped something. It was in a container as I was going to put it into the refrigerator. Verbal frustration followed. I didn't even have like milk all over the floor, but verbal frustration followed. And I said something that I won't say this, this morning. And, and that really bothered me. And later, an hour later, up in the bedroom, I dropped something else. Do you know I said the exact same thing and the exact same frustration followed? And so I started to notice this pattern of behavior. And it could be knee-jerk, and it could be very, very predictable. But it was the exact same response. And so later in the day, I started to think, how do I, how do I go after that? So we all know that Scripture talks about putting off and putting on. So instead of, I, I started to think, instead of complaining and getting verbally frustrated because I dropped something, I ought to praise God that I have the ability to bend down and pick it up. You see? Praise God, not because I dropped something, but because I can physically pick it up. And praise God that I wasn't the one who fell down. Right? So that's, that's the putting off and the putting on. <laughs> now, I've got I to gotta, I gotta tell you, uh, 
Years ago, I watched an uncle kick a plastic trash can probably from like about this back wall here, probably to the entrance of the food pantry outside, and kick it back again. And he was beet red, and he was stomping, and he was snorting, and he went ballistic. Now, he won't watch this sermon because he's deceased, okay? But what happened was, there was a problem in making a batch of candy, and I, and I know my uncle. I know he calculated right away how much money he lost, and he went through the roof. Now, I also think it was partly his sugar, because he was later di diagnosed as diabetic. But between the money, I think the money was like 70%, and the sugar was like 30% of the situation. But he went ballistic, and I've never seen anybody go like, like a madman. I mean, I've been a madman. I was never like that. It was insane. But it was predictable, because he developed a love of money, and that's how he would re respond when he Ching Ching calculated what he was losing monetarily. And it didn't really have to be that way. And, and so what happens is it all works together when it comes to learned and developed behavior and developed sinful behavior in our environment. And, and, and God can break all that, and he does. I came across an article recently. It, listen to this. It pointed out how 47% of us live in the past and focus on past decisions. Think about that. We live in the past. So isn't it, isn't it natural that we're going to follow through? If I acted this way in the past, I'm going to act this way in the future. If I thought this way in the past, I'm going to think this way in the future. And it becomes, it, it becomes so behavioral and so predictable, it's... It, it's actually scary. We, we default to past behavior. Now, I mention this because I've talked about sinful responses. I've talked about physical behavioral triggers. But there are also emotional and mental triggers as well that fit into the sinful pattern. And, and, and I call them mental and emotional ruts. But what happens is the mental and emotional ruts go into spiritual ruts. And those spiritual ruts can be pretty deep. And what happens is something triggers a past situation, maybe a bad experience, maybe a, a, you know, where we fell, maybe the death of a loved one. And then what happens is we dwell and we dig and we go into depression and, and, and sometimes we struggle to rise above it. But what happens is our, our minds and our brains follow this rut, just like the center aisle is parted right here between the, the sets of chairs. And we, and we predictably follow a rut. So, so, you know, the question is, you know, how do we rise above it? Do we find the silver lining? And that's where the Spirit of God has to kick in. And... And when I say has to kick in, he wants to kick in. It's just that we've developed these spiritual patterns of thought and behavior, and we default to the rut. Uh, earlier I mentioned we were creatures of habit. I worked as an exterminator for two to three years, putting myself through college. I took a four-day course up in West Orange, New Jersey, to learn how to kill bugs and rodents efficiently and effectively. And, you know, you learn all their behaviors. You know, what they like, the environment, you know, whether they're curious, whether they're, you know, wary of their environment, you know, something new in their environment. And you start to learn how to do that effectively. I am telling you, most of us would be easily exterminated behaviorally. We are so predictable. We just, we, we just, we're like the bugs in many ways. We just default to certain, certain things that we know. And that's true with the mental and spiritual triggers. We're predictable. And we find those ruts all the time. Back in seminary, I had to keep a spiritual journal for some coursework. 
And I did it over a period of five, six, or eight weeks or so. And I am telling you folks, I was amazed. When I went back weeks later to read my journal, I was like, man, was I in a dark place that day. It was like, where'd that come from? It was absolutely, uh, really amazing. But this is what I also noticed too. Temptations were always stronger when I was physically broken down, when I was mentally broken down, when I was emotionally broken down, and when I was intellectually tapped. And that's when I was ripe for the picking. I was irritable. I didn't respond properly. Maybe I wasn't eating properly. Uh, you know, for those of you who've done the college gig, you know, pizza, soda, soda, pizza, it's, it's insane. And that figures in, too, to how we feel. And, and so what happens after a while is spiritual frustration sets in, depression sets in, discouragement sets in, anger sets in. It's crazy. I mean, I remember walking the halls of seminary one time. It's like, I don't want to be in this place. It was crazy. Thank God God put me in that place. So what I'm saying is that these are things that we need to recognize and realize, and I think we'll be better for it. Real quickly, because I'm almost done. I know I've been speaking long, but interestingly, do you know what the new articles talked about? Decision fatigue. Do you know that when you get up in the morning and you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, after you get your first cup of coffee, right? You, 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 as the day goes along, it's, we experience what's called decision fatigue. And, and so what happens is, it basically means that as the day goes along, we make poorer decisions with food. I think that that's generally true as well spiritually, or it can be. And if we make poorer decisions with food, our energy levels are affected, our mindset's affected, maybe we become more irritable if we're diabetic. You got the, you got the point. It, 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 and look, it, it, it figures into the whole behavioral, right? This is why rest, sleep, eating regularly is, leads to a healthy lifestyle. And, and I mention all these things because I believe that it's relevant to the Christian life. The physical is totally related to the spiritual, and you know that. When you're feeling well physically, you're generally feeling well spiritually. And when you're not feeling well physically, you know, a lot of things really go downward. And I, and I think our Christian lives readily fall into spiritual patterns as such. For example, if we're going to lose weight, we need to identify the patterns of eating and behavior. I did that. I lost 30-some pounds. If we're going to let Jesus live for himself, we need to identify that behavioral part. Scripture talks about renewing the mind, and it's gone after the thought process. But it also has to do with identifying the environmental triggers. If you don't get along with your neighbor, and you've had past spats with them, when you see your neighbor, <laughs> what happens? Right away, you're like in fight or flight mode. And that triggers. That's what happens. When I started the Noom program, I failed daily and weekly. But I, and, and this is important. I made progress. And I would get on the scale every morning, and it was this and I would lose the weight. The same is true spiritually. When we walk with God, we may fail daily and weekly, but I'm, I'm telling you it's going to be, we're going to become more like him. It's just bound to happen. That's the process. It works. If it works in losing weight, I know that it works in terms of mindset and lifestyle as we seek him. I know it does. I know it. I've seen it. I've said this before. None of us are the same when we first came to Christ. We're different. 
We're totally different. And just like we change as people in seasons of life, that is true spiritually as well. God changes us. And when we identify the, the sinful patterns of behavior, I believe it's helpful. Now, I leave you with a, with a final thought. Okay, so I've talked about the difference between testing and tempting. I've talked about food illustrations and behavior patterns. I've talked about patterns that affect the physical, spiritual, emotional, and mental disposition. And I've talked about sinful patterns uh, and behavior, behavior spiritually. I couldn't help but think of Matthew chapter 4. You know when Christ was tempted in the wilderness? He was out there for 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, he was beat up physically. He was beat up mentally, emotionally. I mean, he was just, I mean, he was, at the right time, the devil comes along to try to pluck him. At the right time. And yet we know that Jesus never sinned. And he overcame so that we could overcome. And that is a beautiful picture of our life in Christ. He overcame it all so that we are called overcomers. You know, I, I, I talked earlier about how we become like our parents. It's true. We also become like our Heavenly Father. About, like, we also become more like the Lord. It's true. I'm not the same person as I once was. Neither are you. And as you, as you pursue, as you pursue, pursue God, you might see the, 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 you know, the, the, the fluctuations, the ups and the downs. But that's just part of God t- taking and molding and shaping and remaking. That's, that's just the part of it. There's a way that seems right, and yet God delivers us time and time and time again. May that thought uh, be with us as we approach the communion table this morning.